May it please the Court. Jane Corsler Walsh here on behalf of the appellant Alvaro Guerin, the defendant in the lower court. With me is my trial counsel, Harry Payton, my associate, Stephanie Serafin, and with the Court's permission, I'd like to reserve three minutes for rebuttal. Thank you. We have appealed from a summary final judgment for the plaintiff's poker run on its claim against Alvaro Guerin for breach of an absolute non-conditional guarantee and Alvaro Guerin's counterclaim and affirmative defenses seeking damages and equitable relief. The trial court found that Mr. Guerin waived all defenses by executing this unconditional guarantee. We believe the summary judgment should be reversed for two reasons. First, the summary judgment is based on this Court's decision in Von Duncer. The guarantee language in Von Duncer is markedly different than the guarantee language in this case. Secondly, the just by executing an unconditional guarantee... Well, if Van Duncer doesn't apply, what does it apply? This Court's decision in Warner v. Caldwell, Your Honor. Which says what? Which says that inherent in every guarantee is an obligation of the creditor not to impair the collateral. Unless it's waived. Unless it's waived. And the question is whether the language, which is not very different from Van Duncer at all, affects that result. Well, let's go there, Your Honor. Let's talk about Von Duncer and the language in Von Duncer. A good idea. I think it's a very good idea. The language in Von Duncer, we contend, is markedly different because it contains a phrase not present in our guarantee, and that phrase is that the bank shall have no duties to the guarantors. That phrase is at the end of the clause, which is the same as our clause here, and it says that no act of omission of any kind shall affect or impair the guarantee. The Van Duncer case was decided in the prehistoric times of 1959, correct? 1979. 1979. Still prehistoric. Still extremely prehistoric. Prehistoric. Doesn't everybody – these are all forms. The guarantees are all forms, right? They're not all forms, Your Honor. They are forms that people use, but the forms are different. Okay. Doesn't everybody – and everybody who is lending or borrowing millions of dollars know about the Van Duncer case, or shouldn't they be – to be held to know about it, and can't, including the people who accept the guarantees? I think that's true. And isn't it very easy, if you want to say Van Duncer doesn't apply, to say you cannot mess with the collateral? Your Honor, I think that – And, you know, the other people have rights, too, and they have a lot of rights. They gave out a lot of money in return for, among other things, the guarantee. Can't they say, well, the Van Duncer case has never been overruled or even – or questioned. It's the law of Florida. There's nothing really much different from this. Can't they say, we can do whatever we want with the collateral because Van Duncer says that Mr. Gorin has waived his rights in it? Except they can't. You have – you didn't cite it, but the case of Tropical Jewelers v. Nations Bank. In that case, Judge Schwartz, of course, was on the other side of the case in dissent and thinking that the court should recede from that Van Duncer case. And instead, the majority of the third district in that case did say that guarantors are supposed to have some right that property be disposed in a commercially reasonable manner and liken them to borrowers in the UCC. That's very – that's correct, Your Honor. And how much can you get with a quarter and a dissent? Not much. But you also have the fact that in Duncer, it never mentions Warner, doesn't recede from Warner, and Warner said specifically, you know, notwithstanding the language in the guarantee agreement to the effect that the contract would be unconditional, the law imposes on the creditor an obligation not to deal with the debtor or any security for the debt in such a manner as to harm the interest of the guarantor. That's correct. And Warner is written by the same judge who wrote Van Duncer, interestingly enough. And Van Duncer has that different language, the duty language that you refer to. Yes, it does. Which is perhaps why it didn't mention Warner, but should have at least distinguished itself from Warner, I guess, on the case. Or it was a simple husband and wife guarantee, not this type of more complex business guarantee. All of those reasons could be true. I think the Court's focus on the differences between Van Duncer and our guarantee are very significant. And Judge Schwartz, we cited in our brief 
as did my opposition, the cases that use language which courts have said is sufficient. The language in our case isn't markedly close to those. We've also cited cases, uh, the Marnaloa case and the TD Bank case, that deal with precisely this language, and the courts in those cases held that this precise language is not sufficient to waive surety chip defenses. And the reason is because it doesn't say the bank has no duties to the guarantor. It doesn't say the bank can surrender or release the, uh, the collateral, which is exactly what happened here. We have Poker Run becoming the assignee of the fund who entered into a deal with Ocean Bank to protect itself because its agents had committed fraud in not complying with the mortgages by paying the and, proceeds. And, and your uh, client entered into the deal with the crooks to take some $10 million out of the available funds available to the bank uh, in order to get out of the, out of the case. So, uh, I mean, this, there is no uh, there is no angel here. Everybody is here for the, the everybody money. Is the here, money. Everybody is here for the money. Well, the money was used to pay off the investors. It wasn't just... That's correct. And, and, Your Honor, this is a summary judgment. So, you raise a point, Judge Rosenberg raised a point. Those are precisely the issues that should be litigated in further proceedings on the merits well, of this your, case. Your, your position at the end is that there's a material issue, a genuine issue of material fact on whether or not the bank disposed of this in a commercial reasonable manner. Correct. That's correct, Your Honor. It's our position that you cannot take Warner and Von Duncer square those holdings. You can't take the waiver language in Von Duncer and compare it to the language here. It's not comparable. There's a waiver of surety ship duties. There isn't a waiver in our case, and I will reserve the remainder of my time. Thank you. May it please the Court? Well, Cantero. I've been waiting for this day. <laughs> Here it is, Your Honor. <laughs> I've, I've been waiting for this day, too. <laughs> but I've been, I've been eagerly awaiting this day. <laughs> Uh, Your Honor, to get to Judge Cortinius's question about a material issue of fact, uh, the uh, defendants conceded below in two different hearings, uh, both at the hearing on January of 09 and at the hearing in December of 09, that there were no issues of material fact as to liability. Uh, at the January... Oh, well, why? Because they were seeking summary judgment on their behalf? They, they were seeking summary judgment. Well, of course, everybody okay. says that. Everybody, one side says, rule in my favor, Judge, there's no genuine issue of material fact. The other side says the other thing. That's not a concession, is it? It, it absolutely is. The, the judge asked, is so there if you lose, So if you lose a summary judgment hearing, the fact that you, that you argued for summary judgment precludes you on appeal from saying it was error that the court granted some results. There's no genuine issue of material fact, and we are and we are entitled to judgment as a matter of law. Is that, not, that's what they're saying at any time they do that. Why don't we just get to the merits well, about it? It's that? not just the motion that they filed the motion. It's what they said at the hearing. The judge said, are there any genuine issues of material fact in this case? This is on page 20. Only as it relates to the amount they claim in their affidavit. So they're agreeing, and we agree too, okay, as to uh, what happened. Oh, there's oh, no oh, issue. Okay, okay. If there is no genuine issue of material fact, then the question is, why shouldn't you lose? Because there is no effective waiver of the absolute right to have the collateral dealt, not dealt with improperly. Well, there, there are two reasons. Number one, uh, our uh, guarantee, just like the one in Gunther, as Your Honor pointed out, and as we chart on page 14 of our answer brief... Well, I think I have a problem with that chart because it appears that you recognize you had a problem based upon Warner and Gunther to some extent because when you did your chart, you left out the critical language that deals with the duty. And well, that, that, the, is the di- that is the difference between Warner and Gunther and the difference between this guarantee and Gunther, because in Gunther, it, it talks specifically about the duties and the fact that, you know, that the bank shall have no duties to the guarantor. Yeah. That's what's in Gunther, yes, Your Honor, which is missing. Well, we did point out on page 15 that that language is missing and that we said it doesn't make a difference in this case. Why doesn't it? Be- be- that's, re- 
That is the issue in, okay. in this case. Because the only way I can square Gunther with Warner is based upon that decision. No, there's another reason. Tell me how. Uh, on, in paragraph 5, the language, no act or omission of any kind by the bank shall affect or impair this guarantee. That language is contained in Dunster, it is not contained in Warner versus Caldwell, and it is not at least stated to be contained in any of the other uh, cases from this district. It says, that are no act of omission of any kind by the bank shall affect or impair this guarantee, and the bank shall have no duty to the guarantors. Yes, so. That, and, and the rest that follows is critical. Well, we, I don't think it's critical because. If you only take no act or omission of any kind by the bank shall affect or impair this guarantee, that's enough to say no act or omission shall affect or impair this guarantee. It, it continues down in, in, a, in, a, in a discussion that such contractual waivers of duties or requirements have been consistently upheld by the courts. And I talk about, you know, the, the duties. Yes, but no other case has this language. Uh, Warner doesn't have this language. Capital Bank no, doesn't Warner, have this language. Warner was decided exactly opposite to Dunstan. No, but it doesn't have the language of no act or omission of any kind by the bank shall affect or impair this guarantee. How, how would you reconcile the Tropical Jewelers case? Tropical Jewelers is a UCC case, which is why it hasn't been cited on appeal here. Um, it, it was. Well, they likened it to the UCC. I'm sorry? They likened, they likened it, but the UCC doesn't apply in real estate transactions, and that's why they haven't cited Tropical Jewelers and, and other cases regarding the UCC. I want to make one other point uh, to the court, uh, and that you is on the... you can't overcome the dissent in Tropical. Correct, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't try. <laughs> uh, as we stated in our brief, uh, even if they're correct, um, under the cases of Bacher from this court uh, and Bonet, even if there's an impairment of collateral, the guarantor is released only to the extent that the guarantor is damaged by that impairment, which means only to the extent that the collateral is diminished. The appellant has admitted and in fact has affirmatively argued in the motion for rehearing at page 594 of the record and at page 22 of that motion that there is plenty of collateral left in this property, totaling $19.9 million left as collateral at the time that the guarantor was sued. They attached to that motion as exhibits C and D uh, appraisals of the property, which stated that there were 151 unsold units left in the property, totaling a value of $19.9 million. The appellant was sued for $17 million. So even under their cases, they suffered no impairment of collateral because they, there was plenty of collateral left. And as they argue, and we agree, once you pay on the guarantee, you are subrogated to the rights of the bank, and that is your mortgage. They could have accepted their responsibility, paid off the $17 million, and acquired the mortgage for $19.9 million. That's, but that's undisputed in the record and affirmatively argued by them. So even if they're correct that they were damaged by impairment of collateral, and it, even if this court agrees that this case is not like Dunster at all, but more like Warner, which I disagree with, they still have not suffered an impairment of collateral. Well, what do we make of the fact that, that this was a business enterprise of three individuals, and there seemed to be some sort of Call it fraud, call it something else going on here. And then it's these same individuals that turn on one of their own. They're involved from the beginning. These You can't separate these people. Be that as it may, Your Honor, the, um, I don't think that pertains to the issues in this case as it pertains to the default under the mortgage. Everybody's agreed there was a default here. Well, but he claims, he claims, and, and this is an issue that has to be resolved at trial, is that they told him when they were buying him out, as soon as he brought this to their attention and said, you know, you, you needed to do X and you didn't, and I'm going to let the bank know about this, they buy him out and pay him $10 million. According to him, he, Gorin says that he used the money to pay, uh, his, to repay the investors, and that the, that Segredo lied to him and told him that there was simply a delay 
in delivering the checks to the bank as opposed to, you know, the, the true fact was that, you know, this never went to the bank. It wasn't well, a delay. It was an attempt to purposely not provide the funds and, to the bank. Number one, those facts are not relevant to whether there was a default under the mortgage. It's relevant to summary judgment. It's not relevant because even accepting those facts is true. It, it does not take away that there was a default under the mortgage and that we have a right to go against the guarantor. It may it may be an issue of fact as to an unclean hand, where they had unclean hands, but that unclean hands has nothing to do with whether there's a default and whether we have a right to go against the guarantee. Um, but in, in Bona, this court said that generally where a bank reached restructures a corporate debt without the consent of the grantor, the grantor is released from the grantee. Generally, but it also cites as comparing to Von Dunster, and it cites the other cases, Dorsey, which say that the language of the guarantee governs. So we always go back to the language of the guarantee. And in this case, the language of the... The real issue is, it seems to me, the real issue is the effect of this sentence, which has two parts to it, which was not in... One part was not. One part was not, and one part was. Right. And so... And it seems to me, this is good for you, Mr. Cantero, that the second part is just an explanation of the first part. Well, what I would say, Your Honor, is... If you can do, if the bank can do anything it wants to, as the first part says, without impairing the guarantee, it's obvious that there's no duty to the guarantor. Right. And all we do is look at the first part without looking at the second part. It's surplusage. And especially when it would be so easy just to say, we've got this case since 1912, and everybody knows this in this community. Heaven knows this is not the first time that a disaster has occurred in the real estate market, and all these guarantees are in play. If you don't want Van Dunster to apply, just say so. Yes, Your Honor. With that, unless the Court has any further questions... Thank you. I say you affirm. Getting back to the no-duty language of Van Dunster, it is critical. It's not mere surplusage. Well, why is the first part of the sentence not critical also? I'm going to explain that to you, Judge, and I'm going to quote with the Court's permission from the decision in T.D. Bank that we cite and rely on in our brief. The plaintiff contends that the following language constitutes an express waiver. No act or omission of any kind on the part of the bank shall in any way whatsoever affect or impair this guarantee. Unlike the waiver provisions in Connecticut National Bank, there is no reference to the collateral underlying the subject loan, to the protection or collection of the collateral, or to a waiver of the claim that the collateral has been impaired to the detriment of the defendant guarantor. In fact, the language at issue wholly fails to discuss the defendant guarantor's waiver of any right they may have to challenge the plaintiff's conduct concerning the secured collateral. That is exactly what's going on here. The no-impair language does not tell the guarantor that the bank owes him no duty. The Von Dunster guarantee does. It's very similar to 673.6051, which is the codification of the common law regarding impairment of collateral. And it says everything I said to the Court this morning, that there has to be an express and unequivocal waiver that specifically tells the guarantor that there has been a waiver of duty, the waiver of surety ship defenses. The cases that we have cited on page 22 of our brief. Don't some of these cases say there is a waiver of surety ship defenses in so many words? Yes, Your Honor. This doesn't say that. No, it does not. The cases that uphold the waiver of surety ship defenses are cited on page 22 of our brief and say the guarantor waives all surety ship and similar defenses. Even the cases that they cite have specific reference to the collateral. For example, the chemical bank case. The guarantee stated that the security at any time may be exchanged for any other reason. What does it mean that when it says in so many words the bank can do anything it likes with the collateral without affecting whatever it likes, period, without affecting the guarantee? What does that mean? 
I don't know what it means, Your Honor, but I know that in the Warner case... We know that it has to mean something. I think... Everything has to mean something. Correct. What does this mean, in your opinion? In the Warner decision, this Court said that there is a duty inherent in every guarantee not to impair the collateral. That duty exists regardless of general language in a guarantee, regardless of the fact that... This is not general. This is not general language. The bank can do anything it likes with respect... without impairing the guarantee, correct? But it doesn't say the bank can impair or surrender the collateral, which it cannot do in any instance, based on the cases we've cited in our brief. Even the Fagel case from the Florida Supreme Court says that there's no defenses to negligence. However, it cites a case, the Fuller case from Iowa, that says surrender of collateral is different, and that cannot be condoned even when there's a waiver, because you cannot waive the implied duty of good faith and fair dealing, absent an express waiver to that effect, nor can you agree to condone intentional misconduct and fraud, which is precisely what happened in this case. I have one additional question. It appears that the cases are all over the place. So my concern is, for example, if you look at Hudlett from the Fourth, and this is an old case, too, 1998, it seems to have agreed basically with Warner and disagreed with Dunster, and yet I don't know that any conflict has ever been filed. Do you believe that if we were to reverse this, affirm this case, that we would have to certify conflict with Hudlett or Warner? Well, I think there's inter-district conflict for sure. And when you look at this Court's decision in Bonnet, it addresses what was then raised as an inter-district conflict between Batchelor and Von Dunster. And this Court, in footnote 2 of that decision, said, well, no, there's no conflict, because you look at the express terms of the guarantee, and the guarantees in the cases were different. There was no waiver issue in the Batchelor case. There was a waiver issue in Von Dunster. So that tells me you have to look at the language, and it's going to boil down to, is the language in this case sufficient to waive the duty that exists in every guarantee? In Hudlett, the Fourth District said that despite the exquisite detail in the guarantees for the guarantor's unconditional and irrevocable guarantee of payment of sums due without any regard to the impairment of collateral, summary judgment was improper. That certainly sounds like it's in conflict. It sounds like it's in conflict with Dunster, at least. It does. And more in line with Warner. Judge Sintero very much enjoys Tallahassee. He will go back there again. Two other points I'd like to make. One, with regard to the notion that we've suffered no impairment because the collateral is still in existence, I'd like to point this Court to the January 109 receiver report, which indicates that there had been few, if any, sales because the market had crashed. So whatever that appraisal was worth at the time, it's certainly not worth that now. And again, that would be a question of fact for further proceeding. And finally, I'd like to close with the thought that it's contrary to public policy to give collateral away. This Court needs to bring clarity to this issue, particularly in the awful economic times, and I would ask that this Court reverse the summary judgment. Thank you. Thank you. And final case is...